All right, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Herr Professor Dr. Sinova of Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. Uh, higher for short. Yeah, well. <laughs> and Herr uh, got his uh, uh, bachelor in 94 in, from Ohio State. Very then he moved to Indiana University and uh, got his PhD in uh, 99, working with Stephen Girvin. And then he got a postdoc in the University of Tennessee and another one in UT Austin, working with Alan McDonald. And uh, then uh, in 2003, he was hired by <clears throat> the best place on earth, Texas and m University. And he's been here for till 2014, right? 11 years, actually, according to your CV. <laughs> and <laughs> after that, he got um, uh, what Alexander Hon 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 Humboldt professorship and, uh, in the University of Mainz in Germany. And uh, uh, poor thing had to move to the other side of the world. And despite that ordeal, he's done quite well for himself. Probably sufficient to say that what we have 50% success rate in our grant application between two of us. And uh, uh, since then, <laughs> and, and and he also published a lot of papers, and he's, he's the head of a big uh, research group and uh, in, in a beautiful place, in fact, in, in Mainz. And I'm sure he's going to talk about it a lot more. Uh, he's been known for his works on spintronics, antiferromagnetic spintronics, transport phenomena in uh, magnetic systems and magnetic metals and, and, and so forth. And one of the driving force behind the spin-orbit interaction and the uh, use of spin-orbit interaction in different uh, systems, physical systems. And uh, today he's going to talk about the new things which they were discovered and which called alter magnets. And here the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Artem. Uh, we turn that off. Or... Um, so wonderful to be here during November. It's the best time to visit you guys. It's 23 degrees, it's sunny instead of a slightly gray and a little colder in Germany. Um, so today it's actually funny that uh, Art had mentioned that about my expertise in spin orbit coupling because today it's about turning that off and showing some other things that appear that we were expecting. Um, the work that I'm telling you is actually my talk. I'm actually following the talk that uh, my colleague Thomas Youngworth, uh, that I've collaborated now for a long, long time, close to 25 years together. And uh, Libor Smekiel have uh, pioneered, uh, then together with many collaborators that have made that happen here. Uh, but uh, if you want to see the, the same version of the talk, uh, but probably by a much better speaker, uh, Thomas has also in, my, in our seminar series that we just gave it last week as well, in case something is not clear, uh, that's also a very nice place to look at it. Um, so I'm telling you today about this idea of alter magnets and what they are. I'm going to try to explain and why we actually vision it or, or, or believe in it to be an, a, a new uh, a class of. Uh, why doesn't it move? It doesn't like it. Huh? Should be that it moves. Okay, no, okay. Um, so on ultramagnetism, uh, we believe uh, for the following reasons that is actually an emerging. Uh, new uh, magnetic class. Uh, it is uh, a class where you can see it's compensated, non frustrated collinear magnetic structures. So that itself is well defined. Uh, they have these uh, spin splittings between the bands uh, that are non relativistic and well defined, uh, which is very unique that both, as I've mentioned, antiferromagnets and ferromagnets, the regular antiferromagnets, don't have. Um, they actually show uh, a phenomenology of a spin transport and a spin core physics and electronics that is very unique. Uh, it has, again, from different uh, alternate behavior uh, depending on how you look at it. And uh, it is a separate uh, a spin conserving symmetry class. You can actually identify by the symmetry, directly by the symmetry, and identify the actual uh, phase itself. It represents a fairly abundant class of materials. It's just not just one or two exceptions, it's not anomalies. And it's relevant in actually, supposedly, believe in many fields that have not really thought about this, this physics. Um, 
one thing that is important to point out that is this, this, uh, this idea of, of extreme conserving and symmetry classes, uh, we'll try to do that in the next part, in the last part of the talk, uh, to really demonstrate that it is a uniquely defined. And this is not just something that is just anomalies, and that's what we'll try to explain. Um, this is it's a little bit related to maybe the nail story of identifying these paramagnets that were very funny uh, in the 30s and the 40s, uh, and, I, and uh, he identifying them as uh, antiferromagnets. So similar like that, we have actually been seeing these materials with these funny behaviors, and it is now that we can actually have the toolbox to uh, classify them and uh, identify why they are this way. Uh, and that's what the story is about today. So because the colloquium and you guys, uh, well, it could be, uh, most of you guys are condensed matter physicists here, but some of you are not. Uh, we start maybe from the, from the basics of how band structure happens, how actually electrons are forming bands and behaving in a solid state environment. If you actually have a normal uh, uh, solid, uh, normal atom, you have the distinct levels that they appear. And once you actually put them closer together, these levels, they start to repel and interact with each other and then create these bands that once you actually put them all together and they overlap with each other, these bands are indistinguishable. They just become these regions of allowed energies. As you can see, as a function of distance, that's how you actually develop these bands from this bonding and antibonding behavior. And not only that, uh, once you actually, these guys uh, live in that environment with these very strong electric fields uh, and uh, the interactions produced by the, uh, by the atoms, uh, you actually have a state where the actually state of the material that you have depends on the atom arrangement, depends on the crystal symmetry quite strongly. And uh, not only that, of course, you also have that the momentum itself, even though you have these very strong interactions, is a good quantum number. They move, move due to the blocks theorem almost freely through the material. Um, uh, and from this, this is the idea of these band structures that they move almost like normal, normal electrons. Now, within this crystal environment, you also have many other interactions. Uh, some of them, of course, that bond you, create the, mag the vibrations, the magnetic phon the phonons, et cetera. But one of them that is responsible for creating phases of matter that are magnetic, this is the exchange interaction. This exchange interaction arises from the combination of Coulomb interaction and Pauli exclusion principle. Essentially, the fact that uh, in order to reduce the cost of the Coulomb interactions, you try to avoid the electrons to be at the same place at the same time. Uh, you create, therefore, an anti-symmetric wave function in the real part of the space and a symmetric one in the, or, or order one symmetric in, in the spin part, uh, creating this spin-spin this, uh, this -spin interaction. Now, these spin interactions uh, can be of both types, the ones that line you up and anti-line you. Uh, the one that was, of course, known, so before, since I'm going to talk about a third uh, class of magnetic uh, material, of magnetic class, let me first talk about the one that you're all familiar with and that we actually know for a long, long time. This is, of course, ferromagnetism. It's known now for you know, 2,000 years. Uh, this actually came from Magnesia. Uh, the idea of the name comes from a Greek uh, region of Magnesia where uh, magnetite was this uh, occurring natural material uh, uh, occurs. Uh, and this is where, in this case, in this simple example, you have, in this, uh, I chose this iron lattice, where you have the spins uh, themselves, they have an exchange interaction that is global, tends to align or, anti, uh, or align with it, create a spin up and a spin down to bands that is split between them. So the bands themselves, now they're going to have uh, a split behavior of the spin ups and the spin downs due to this interaction. And uh, because of this global nature and the localized nature, they tend to be metallic. Uh, and this one is one that is easy to change the orientation of the spin ups and the spin downs by applying the magnetic field. So if you actually uh, switch the, magnetic, uh, the orientation of the magnetization uh, from up, which in this case is here, to a down, uh, you can just reverse here the, uh, the energy spectrum. Now, these have been uh, the most the workhorse of information technology. This is the reason why you can actually talk now through Zoom and, uh, and all this uh, um, uh, the cloud computing that you're able to do uh, due to the analog to, uh, to digital conversion, the ink to spin uh, revolution that occurred uh, right around the 2000s uh, with introduction of giant magnetic resistance that allowed um, for a very sensitive uh, 
uh, detection of the uh, of the bits in this high density hard drives uh, that are still uh, the workhorses uh, of, of this information technology that we have today. Now, on the other hand, uh, this also shows uh, different phenomena that now is very prevalent. Uh, two of them are very important. One of them is, for example, anomalous Hall effect. This was known for a long time since actually Hall discovered the normal Hall effect. In a ferromagnetic system, due to the spin orbit couplings, uh, you actually have, as you drive a current through a, a ferromagnet, you can drive, a def you deflect uh, the spin ups and the spin downs differently, creating a very strong signal that is proportional to the magnetization of the material, uh, perpendicular to the sample. Uh, this is physics that is correlated to the spin orbit coupling and various curvature. Uh, and then in the other one, in the more practical sense, you have the new modern magnetic random access memory that are based on the spin transfer coil where you have two ferromagnetic uh, electrodes that depend a lot now on the fact that you have spin polarized currents going through the systems. And these are spin polarized currents originating uh, from one of the ferromagnetic electrodes is able to transfer the information of the angular momentum to another and flip the one um, reading uh, ferromagnet electrode while the other one is spinned, okay, often enough. And uh, this is actually now commercial, that uh, is magnetic random access measure, measure uh, memory space on spin transfector, for example. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, magnetic phase tend to be electrically and magnetically active. That's the important aspect of it. Now you have uh, the other magnetic phase that we are familiar with is antiferromagnet. And antiferromagnets really are anti ferromagnets. It does almost the opposite of antiferromagnets. Whereas in the ferromagnet, the magnetic ordering of electrons is global. You can actually, it's macroscopic, you can see it. Uh, here, the magnetic order in an antiferromagnet is cloaked. You don't see it externally. The total magnetization is zero. Uh, and uh, unless you have, of course, a weak ferromagnet. And uh, not only that, the order tends to be more, more local. They actually, their or the exchange interaction is, uh, it tends to anti-align locally uh, one sublattice and another sublattice. And here I've used uh, the, uh, the one, of course, that nailed this cover in the 40s. It's actually amusing to understand that antiferromagnetism was actually uh, found after a superconductivity. It's one of the actually latest um, ordered phase that we've actually discovered uh, because of that cloaking device that you couldn't really detect it. And uh, he identified, and AL identified um, these paramagnets that were showing some anomalies in their behavior relative to magnetic fields that you apply to them, uh, and ferromagnets as antiferromagnets, and identify them as a magnetic uh, order class itself. And, and these ones themselves tend to have, uh, because of the local nature of the ordering, and exchange uh, to be more anti um, insulating. So most of the Fermi energy, where, where it resides uh, at the gap that is created between the two. And then not only that, if you consider that this, uh, just looking at the magnetic atoms alone, uh, for simplicity, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the two uh, a, a unit cell with two magnetic uh, atoms um, that are oppositely aligned, it is actually a theorem known since the 30s, Kramer theorem, that tells you that the bands themselves will be degenerate, that you're going to have equal number of spins up and spin downs. This is the case because you have a, a symmetry uh, in this case, which is parity and time reversal. So time reversal is broken. Uh, parity, uh, which is the inversion, space inversion, um, uh, combined with, with time re reversal, is a symmetry of the system. You can actually see it here because if you actually take this as the point of inversion, you take this guy to this side as you go here, and then you apply the time reversal and you end up with the same lattice. Okay? By doing so, the, when you do the transformation in the band structure, uh, parity and time, so time, uh, parity and time will act on the spin as reversing it because parity doesn't act on it, but time will flip the spin. But parity and time acting on the momentum will actually not reverse it because it does it twice. So parity, when you change the, when you inverse space, you change the momentum. And when you do time reversal, you change the momentum, so therefore it doesn't change. So the transformation of PT uh, gives you the same state but with opposite spin. And because PT is a symmetry of this two sublattice system, simple sublattice collinear system, uh, 
this will actually tell you that essentially the energy, because it's a symmetry of the, of the, of the system, is going to be equal to its energy. And combining uh, with the same spin, and combining these two lines give you this Kramer's degenerate theorem, where essentially other, you know, it maps this, this PT symmetry maps the Kramer's pair to the same momentum with opposite spin. And this mapping gives you this, uh, this uh, degeneracy. So in a sense, now you have something that is both electrically and magnetically inert. And in this sense, they are anti-ferromagnets. They are highly disordered, but it's still anti. Now, uh, what is this gives you a bit of a paradox because uh, you have nailed that actually discovered these antiferromagnets, and they say, well, they're interested, but not very applicable. Yeah, they're not because of this, this nature, the fact that they are inert, both electrically and magnetically, the ones that they like to, uh, particularly the, the root, and, uh, root piles uh, that, uh, that, they, that Nail like to, to, to point out. Uh, but on the other hand, Nail himself had a bit of a weight when he said that because he, he was actually a very practical physicist, very applied physicist. He's actually responsible for um, uh, the figuring out uh, and saving many lives during World War II by figuring out the technique how to demagnetize entire ship holes uh, to avoid uh, these magnetic uh, uh, mines, uh, water mines. Yeah. And so actually, you, it's a very expensive procedure of, of having like uh, five miles of, of, uh, of coils wrapped around a, 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 a single ship. You actually also do that, or every single submarine has the same process of the magnetization. Um, and you know, one wonders, you know, this is this paradox, if now antiferromagnets does this demagnetization process that is so expensive and difficult to do uh, for free, why cannot they be practical? Okay. Uh, now, for a long time, magnet, of course, antiferromagnets were not used at all until this revolution that I showed you in 2007. They have been already revolutionary because they have been used to pin down ferromagnets. This occurred by the fact that instead of being insulated, we just made them metal so they could actually introduce them with the other devices uh, and uh, create this, uh, uh, this exchange bias that is called that pins the, the, the reference ferromagnet to be able to have this very sensitive or their uh, uh, reading of ferromagnetic electrode in your very sensitive read heads that you have nowadays. But remains a passive element. It is not an active element. And this is where the physics of antiferromagnetic spintronics began a decade ago, almost 2014 or 2011, uh, in particular by my colleague Thomas Jangwer. This was actually the idea of his ERC advanced grant that he actually proposed. Uh, by looking at these antiferromagnets, uh, by the advantage that they profess, they have, of course, order spins. They're non volatile, similar to ferromagnets. They're also radiation, radiation uh, hard, similar to those. But the, the idea that they have no net moment. Uh, you know, I forced them to have very much better scaling in terms of the technology. Um, they actually have terahertz dynamics, which is actually I forced them to bridge this communication gap that happens in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, that is much more effective. Uh, and then uh, they they also have multiple stable neuron-like states uh, that allow you for neuromorphic hardware computing. And uh, uh, material-wise, there's many more antiferromagnets and ferromagnets they tend to have in terms of the, of the range of materials that show that. So the notion of antiferromagnetic spintronics is to really make these guys uh, a direct manipulation of electrically manipulate uh, both thermally and electrically uh, the, the nail order, which is difficult to do with a magnetic external magnetic field. Uh, also to uh, make them active elements, create that bridge between the uh, terahertz gap and maybe even in the isolators uh, have more efficiency of a spin efficiency. This actually, in spite of the fact that they remained, you know, by making them metallic now, instead of making them uh, insulating, uh, but it's still being a spin degenerate, this uh, copper manganese arsenide and manganese ar to gold, these are these uh, horse materials, uh, uh, workhorse materials that are PT symmetric, essentially this cremish degenerate, uh, antiferromagnets, or we call, call them PT, uh, nailed antiferromagnets, if you like. Um, we were able to show and predict in 2014 that you could actually, it's actually a couple of years ago when I was back here, uh, in one of my visits, uh, they showed you that the, the prediction that we had, 
that electrically you could actually switch the nail, you know, with couple, the nail uh, order parameter. Uh, and then there was demonstrated both in copper manganese arsenide and in manganese to gold. And then afterwards there were different, uh, a lot of work uh, done in this, uh, in this field, looking at the optical manipulations, uh, topological, uh, looking at the manipulation of topology, insulating aspects, etc. But it's still remaining this idea that they are anti-ferromagnets. They are not, they're really behaving completely opposite to the ferromagnet themselves. And uh, here, this is, by the way, it's a very biased uh, demonstration of all these things. This is from our group and the one in mind, particularly. Uh, there's many, many, many people that are working now in this uh, field is very active. Uh, and uh, here, there's some reviews that, uh, that have been written uh, that I give here as references uh, for those who would like to maybe know a little more about all these activities there. But you know, now looking back at, at these two phases, where I have said one is this global exchange that splits your bands, okay? You have a spin up and spin down splitting. And the other one that creates this band that they just live together, they're essentially, uh, you know, colorless or something because they just simply combine both, the black, or the gray they're called, they could combine both the black and white, or the spin reversal. It's difficult to imagine that there's something else, okay? Until we remember that the spins are not just simply an energy state, but they also depend on momentum. There is dispersion. And in this case, once you think of the dispersion, there is an alternate uh, possibility. And this is the possibility that we've uh, realized uh, with this workhorse material, ruthenium uh, oxide, which is actually a rutile, uh, it's actually a black swan of the rutile family because most of these rutiles are, these oxides are uh, insulating. This one happens to be a metal and happens to be, of course, uh, antiferromagnetically ordered, which was only discovered in 2017 uh, due to this new activity to look back and, uh, and more carefully about antiferromagnets. Now, in this particular case, uh, this, uh, uh, this behavior here now is the fact that you now remember that uh, this that I mentioned to you, this, this Kramer's theorem, that if you actually have a, a lattice with just true magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic uh, elements in your unit cell, uh, in your basis, the theorem says that it will always be degenerate because you can always combine, essentially translate due to parity, one lattice into the other and to combine it with tan reversal from that theorem, you don't get away. If you ignore everything else and you just focus on the spins, but what, gives you this possibility is the fact that if you remember, there's also non-magnetic atoms running around here, which are the oxygens that break that parity. You cannot now just simply choose here and then map one into the other one. Then essentially the oxygen atoms will be different places. It, will, it, will not, you're not, it doesn't have parity uh, as, as, a, as a possibility, but you actually have in this particular case, a fourfold rotation that you have to rotate and combine it with time reversal to actually have uh, this symmetry restored. And then once you have this, this 90 degree rotation to combine with time reversal guarantees then that you're gonna have from now, instead of the mapping of one spin onto itself with the same momentum, that case gives you that degeneracy, you actually are going to have a guaranteed that for a spin up in this state, with a 90 degree rotation, you will have a spin down. That will be its cremous pair, but lives in a different space of, of the brilliant zone, in this case, connected by this 90 degree rotation, but this rotation on time reversal, uh, and, but with opposite splitting. And this now you have the split bands due to this connected symmetry. Okay. Uh, so you have an alternating spin splitting and zero magnetization system. Now, as I mentioned, this is, in this case, instead of looking at that something curious, that this is what at the beginning when we were calculating the band structures and seeing that this has been split in the calculation of the band structure as something interesting, that you know, curious, funny looking antiferromagnets. In this case, the fact that they have no magnetization, that looks like an antiferromagnet. But they have that, they have a split bands that looks like a ferromagnet. 
So do you think of it as an anomalous antiferromagnet or an anomalous ferromagnet? Or just as a different phase in itself? Or can you really consider it as a phase by looking at the symmetries in a sense? So we argue, and of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, that this is a, a, a really distinct phase. You can identify it. And we have now the, the tools and the means to identify many of the materials that can have them. And uh, uh, in order to do so, let me actually go split this in, th in two parts. Uh, we're going to split the pa part in two parts. We're going to talk about the phenomenology and the consequences of this type of microscopic behavior. And then afterwards, I'm going to go into the actual mathematical tool, the symmetry analysis tools that one can look back and utilize to identify it as a class, as a distinct class, uh, not something that overlaps with, with others, that is just uh, some particular um, uh, material. Okay. Uh, so, then the, uh, so let's uh, start just discussing the first part of, of what the consequences of these um, split bands connected by this rotation are, and then uh, discuss afterwards how one can identify them mathematically uh, by what is called the spin group theory. Uh, now, we first start. Uh, by the way, how long do I have there until this is 45 minutes, right? Or something like that. Okay. Half an hour? Okay, perfect. Um, anyway, it doesn't mean I can stop any time. Um, now, uh, one of the things that is curious for this one, uh, that in the alter magnets, you actually have this spin splitting that we discussed. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you have a question? This is the spin orientation, but because I'm going to argue that I'm going to look at a, a, a non-spin orbit coupled physics, the spin direction is now uh, arbitrary. It will only be determined by the, by, the, by the local ordering of the nail vector, but that's not connected now. The direction of the, of the nail vector of the, of the ordering is not connected to the lattice now. Yeah? Because as I say, you don't have a spin orbit coupling, you just have colors, the spin up and the spin down. But you don't have that's why that's why we, we put colors rather than spins when we talk about that okay just to be, to distinguish it because we're talking about non spin of non non relativistic physics and when you don't have relativity you don't have a connection between the spin and the and the and the real space okay well the color around is identifying essentially the sub lattice so this is the sub lattice which is the one uh, connecting the, uh, the environment, the anisotropic environment that is created by the, by the non-magnetic atoms in this case, which is the one that is actually breaking that symmetry, which are key actually for this physics. Okay. Very good question, thank you. Uh, so then to, uh, one of the things that is unique is that in here, the spin splitting is very different from any other spin splitting that you can actually see. Uh, when you look at the non-magnetic phase in this, uh, uh, this lithium oxide, uh, you actually have a very uh, strong anisotropy but due to the local inversion symmetric electric field, uh, uh, crystal field. These crystal fields that occur in this, uh, uh, in this, this materials that have these uh, this, this structures uh, are fairly strong. And then you actually have essentially this is a split of the bands, but in this case, these are degenerate, the spin degenerate split of the bands here. Okay, this is, this is still in the non-magnetic phase above the nail temperature. But once you actually uh, turn on uh, the ultramagnetic order, also it's, it's magnetically ordered, what happens to these bands, the origin of the splitting is actually connected to this electric crystal field because this local anisotropy makes the exchange that actually is a split in the bands with opposite splitting in opposite sub lattices. Here you have, as you can see, the A sub lattice being dominated. Essentially, you can actually follow that this is part of the, and if you look at the dominated um, sub lattice projection the, in the, the A sub lattice, it would be like this band, and then in 90 degrees will be connected to this band. So this is where mostly the electrons are residing primarily in this, this band, and then they be the same, okay? And here you can actually think of it, once you actually turn on the, the splitting, it's a splitting both in opposite directions, but that creates then a splitting between the A and B sub lattice, okay, of different spins. So in this case, in one direction, in the KX, in the X direction, you have one splitting of spin ups and spin downs in the opposite, in the KY direction, 
you have the opposite split heads. Okay, and this is uh, you know at the gamma points, and since in some is points in there, the gamma points it will always be degenerate. That's actually you can show that directly, and some other planes that have a high symmetry will also be degenerate. Uh, but generally, during the whole brilliant zone, you still have this ninety degrees connection, and this type of splitting is unique. That has not really been identified before. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. What tools are you going to use to define that? This is the part that I'm going to talk later. Yeah. So this is actually, yeah. Okay. So not at all. Actually, that's the that's so. Thank you. That's a great question because actually that would be addressed by the other ones because it will have very different behavior from the splittings that actually due to the Rashba on the Dressel house on the electric field induced. For one thing, they're much stronger. This this is the only time. That just looking at the symmetry, because this is exchange interaction, which is much, much stronger than the weak relativistic interaction, just by saying they identified that you have a splitting without spin orbit coupling, you know that this splitting will be, in, in principle, much, much larger effect. But uh, you will see in a minute that, for example, the actually locking itself, whereas this at number locking uh, or, or momentum locking is at, as you go around the spin, like in the Rashba, in this case, is even. And it's actually going to be quite distinct. And not only that, the tools that you need to use is not the magnetic groups, because the magnetic groups and the analysis that you tend to do would only tell you that there's a splitting. You cannot distinguish between whether it's a spin orbit coupling or, or, or a diesel effect. They are all mixed together. It's not designed to distinguish them. You have to now use the tools that split the two to identify it. And in this case, that is why it's unique uh, and it's quite different. Yeah. So in that sense, I mean, it had been discussed at, uh, or I think even Rashba was in, in the Zunger, in the wrong paper, actually. <laughs> yeah, they actually made a mistake uh, where they say, oh, it's a spin orbit coupling because, but it's not really because if I say that, then that means that the spin direction will be connected to the momentum. But it's not. In this case, it's definitely not. In, this, in the one of the, of the spin orbit coupling, the direction of the spin is connected to the momentum. Here it's not, which is also quite different as well. No, but it's actually, if you look at it at the 90 degrees, it will be, in the other one, it will be always odd. In this one, it will be even. Okay, you will see that. You can be very fooled. But in this particular case, it's definitely not. There's not, not an equivalent in the other one. There is one where it's called an isotropic exchange, where you will actually have identified other parts of the, of the brilliant zone, these splittings that look like a little bit like that. Uh, but this one is, in this case, very unique in the, in the phenomenology of it. Uh, so just as I mentioned here, uh, this, case, this is essentially thinking that you have this momentum is essentially constant exchange with opposites by splitting, opposite exchange for the opposites for the A and B sub lattices. Uh, and compared to the one that is global, uh, in, in ferromagnets you have this uh, magnetic exchange that is global. And the, as I mentioned now, the thing to do to the uh, question, uh, that this is uh, much stronger because compared to the weak relativistic uh, uh, fields that come from global spin inversion. In this case, it's a local uh, symmetry breaking that you have this. And they tend to be, in this particular case, of the oxide and, uh, and other materials that were identified, and then the DFT calculation for very strong splittings of electron balls, which are huge if you're familiar with spin orbit coupling. Spin orbit coupling in the solid state environment tends to be on the order of milli electron volts. Uh, so this is almost a thousand times larger. Now, it also has, now this was actually the bulk. So this was the core physics of this, the core spin physics. Are they also electrically active? Can we now create spin currents which are very, very relevant for things like giant magnetic resistance and GMR and uh, GMR that are relevant for these things? And in this case, the answer is yes. And the first example here, if you look at the geometry, because of the anisotropy that you have in the spin ups and the spin downs of your band, so this is the Fermi surface, once you run a current here, in this case, for the 110 direction, you will see that you have a majority of the spin-ups and a minority of the spin-downs. 
And therefore, this spin current in this particular direction will be polarized. And this will cause the consequences of that, as we calculated with the uh, uh, DFT calculations in this, in this work here, uh, it will give you very strong uh, GMR effects and tunnel magnetic resistance effects in these systems, which are the workhorse of all our devices uh, that are actually uh, used nowadays in, in, the, in the ferromagnetic along the memory sector. And in this case, in a system that has no magnetization or it can be magnetized as much as you like. Uh, another effect uh, in the industry, so you can have these straight fields, for example. Uh, another effect that is very uh, important that is actually, was actually a nice prediction that we had as well, is that not only do you have this charge spin polarized currents, you also can have pure spin currents just by rotating your, your uh, this uh, orientation in 45 degrees. So now you run the current in the one over direction. So essentially in this picture, you will just run the current in this direction. And in doing so, you immediately realize that you have of course, charged, unpolarized charged current in this direction because there's equal amounts of spin up and spin downs. But now you have a diffusive, actually a dissipated, uh, but very large spin current in the opposite, in this perpendicular direction to the charged current because of the splittings being so much larger, the actual effect for the lithium oxide is 38% of the spin hole angle, which is far, far larger, in mag order of magnitude larger than any found in a 30,000 uh, DFT machine learning computation of all of the possible anomalous uh, spin hole effects due to the Berry's phase. This is just by looking at this non-relativistic non, non physics that we were able to predict that. But this is not, I want to emphasize, just a prediction now. Just a few weeks after we put that on the archives, the Cornell team uh, started looking into it very carefully because it's, we tend to have a good uh, predicting uh, track record and observed it as well. So this is now being observed in the experiment that it was just immediately after this appeared on the archives, they looked for it and now they've observed it. I don't know if it's already published or not uh, by the Dan Ralph's uh, team in Cornell. So these things are happening. This is not just imagination uh, in this sense. Uh, and of course, Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be in the data storage, but in terms of looking at the effects that it will have in other fields, it will be large. Because as I'm going to show you, this is, this is going to become a surprise, what I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, because right at the moment, you know, we look at ruthenium oxide, this is a thing that attracted our attention uh, to these to this splittings and try to figure this out. Why is this a curious material? Is it not? Or how broad this is? And this is where we actually go on into the symmetries to understand it. Another thing that this has, uh, I mentioned to you a, a very important effect in, in ferromagnetism is anomalous hole effect. And we do know that also in antiferromagnets that are non-collinear, that this anomalous hole effect occurs because the anomalous hole effect is allowed if you break, if you are in a, in a system that allows for an axial vector for magnetization, that's what happens to be uh, in a ferromagnet back for free. Uh, now, in this case, uh, we actually predicted uh, this crystal hole effect in this ruthenium oxide that it would be very strong because uh, if you know about anomalous hole effect that comes from a spin orbit coupling, of course, but it is very important that there is near these band crossings that happen close to the Fermi surface. In most ferromagnets, these things would be a bit accidental. You look for the ones that have these band crossings close to the Fermi surface that would be very strong. In this alter magnets, it will come guaranteed these crossings, because without spin orbit coupling, of course, uh, you have uh, this uh, very strong uh, crossings. And then once you turn on the spin orbit coupling in this region, it creates very large hotspots of anomalous hull effect that then will be uh, observed. Not only that, one thing that is unique from this one is that whereas an anomalous hull effect cannot be turned off in an ferromagnet, because you cannot turn off magnetization in a sense, in here, this anomalous hull effect is connected to the symmetry, and this symmetry will be connected to the orientation of your nail vector. And you can turn that on and off if you manage to uh, orient or reorient this nail vector. Again, just want to emphasize that this was a prediction, but it's also a reality uh, because immediately that was actually before this uh, spin hole effect, uh, a 
it was followed up uh, by, uh, by Feng and collaborators in China, uh, where now there's an experiment that has shown clearly that you have that in lithium oxide. These other materials that we have that are showing that anomalous Hall effect and that are also alter magnets, uh, but this is also, as I said, uh, discovered. And it was a very big surprise because remember this Kramer's theory, everybody associated these collinear antiferromagnets with Kramer's degeneracy. They never thought in a million years, just by looking at the symmetry, that anomalous Hall effect would be allowed. Uh, at the time, we called it a crystal Hall effect, but now we know that this is connected to this alter magnet phase uh, that we talk about. Now, uh, in the last 15 minutes, uh, let me discuss the next part about how we actually go about identifying from the symmetry class uh, these particular materials and this class. Why are we defining it? So in this case, not just simply by saying, oh, it's just a peculiar different magnet. Now, uh, remember the phase, the, the, the rotation that I mentioned that you do a 90 degree rotation and a 180 degree rotation in spin space. Okay. This is the actual symmetry that the lithium oxide has, the one that I was looking at. Are you allowed to actually do such a thing? Can you do nice space rotation and spin rotation separately? Now, most of you, a large percentage here, the study in Moscow Institute of Technology or somewhere there, and use Landau, will actually know the answer immediately as soon as you open Landau. And says no. Why? Because uh, if you look at just from the classical point of view, uh, the magnetization that is arising from the uh, currents uh, are going to be due to the, to the space uh, currents that are generating this magnetization. And if you look at the relativistic spin orbit coupling, the more fancy part, uh, the more sophisticated part, you also have the spin orbit coupling arising from. Uh, the relativistic effects that couple both. So therefore, if you actually do a rotation in spin space, you have to do it in real space. But is that all we have? Now, if you look at this physics, you say, okay, that's, that's always coupled. And in reality, that is true. Essentially, they would not be uncoupled. But in here, if you actually do that, you would actually mix different strengths because spin orbit coupling is weak. Okay, also the other part of the classical one. But there's something in between that we have actually, which is well defined actually as well, uh, which, which we left some room in there, which is the non relativistic quantum mechanics. And this is by assuming that you, you essentially you don't have a couple in between the spin, and uh, because you know that exchange interaction, which is non relativistic in this case, uh, is just connected uh, uh, to non relativistic physics, is going to be dominated. And the, the one that in fact, is the one responsible for the origin of the magnetic phase, the fact that you have this instability, or where the magnet points, etc. That's due to relativistic weak effects, you know, these anisotropies. But the origin is just coming without it. Now, in order to do that, you actually, uh, you know, in this case, um, you will have to, of course, in this case, by the connection, you will always do the what is called the magnetic group theory uh, or analysis. This magnetic group analysis, you couple both spin and real space together, okay? And study your symmetry groups that way and classify your systems. Now in doing so, in this case, if you use that mathematical tool of magnetic groups in terms of analyzing your symmetries, you will not be able to separate, because it's not designed to, any non-relativistic physics of this sort, which are very strong as I showed you, and the, um, the, the, uh, the, the relativistic physics of spin orbit coupling which tend to be weak, they will all be mixed. So you cannot identify or separate it. Not only that, many of the magnetic groups will not distinguish you between a ferromagnet and antiferromagnet. Both a, a one type of ferromagnet and an antiferromagnet can belong to the same magnetic group, often belong to the same magnetic group, okay? So that cannot distinguish that either. You cannot differentiate those classes even at that level. Now, on the other hand, in the 70s, there was a nice development where you actually did have this mathematical tool developed by, uh, of course, it started, of course, with Shufnikos with the bicolors, but formally done uh, here, that's what we follow here, at least, uh, Litvin's work, uh, where you can actually separate the two, okay? And they only link by the time, when you do time reversal, that consider spin reversal in spin space. And um, in this case, uh, this is a much larger generalization of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the magnetic groups, so the spin groups, now you're actually able to decouple 
the rotations, the, the operations that you do in one space and the other, and to be able to, uh, to generalize the magnetic groups in a sense. Uh, although uh, there is not a correspondence or a direct correspondence between a spin group and a magnetic group because of the fact that it has these spin symmetries that the magnetic groups themselves will not have. Essentially, you want to create that tool that can differentiate these phases. Um, and this is a tool that you effectively will want to use if you want to describe these magnetic phases that are distinct, particularly a collinear or, or, or coplanar. Uh, magnetic groups cannot distinguish between a coplanar and, 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 uh, or a collinear, coplanar, and non-coplanar uh, uh, magnetic order. Now, uh, an important part is that you have in these uh, spin groups, uh, these uh, spin space alone symmetries, which do not exist in the magnetic groups. And these are the ones that can identify whether you have a collinear magnet, a coplanar magnet, or a non-coplanar magnet. For the collinear magnet, you have this symmetry that you can have essentially any rotation around the axis with the spin's point, and also 180 degree rotation perpendicular to the axis. Uh, for the coplanar, it's just a 180 degree rotation perpendicular to the plane. And for the non coplanar magnets, they don't have any of those symmetries. Um, now, the nice thing of this, of course, is that this is a, a theory that describes this as spin conserved in outer magnetism. And as I mentioned, uh, it's a generalization of, of effects. Uh, now, uh, if you now use that tool, since I'm running out of time, um, then you can now begin to describe uniquely the different phases by looking at the point groups, the spin point groups. Now, this is actually one thing that, in, uh, as I mentioned, in magnetic groups, you cannot separate, you can physically separate three different magnetic phases by this analysis of the non-relativistic spin groups. The first one is that you have essentially a normal, uh, the outer magnet, okay? So you have this one that happens to be one third. And these are systems that are connecting time reversal is connected to a rotation that takes one sublattice into the other. And here we're only focusing just for simplicity in the collinear uh, antiferromagnets or the collinear systems, collinear magnetic systems, pardon me. And uh, the other ones uh, that has the connection that you, trans you actually transpose one uh, sublattice into the other by, by inversion or translation, this corresponds to the Kramer's degenerate antiferromagnets, the, the normal nail antiferromagnets, and of course the ferromagnetic one, and in this case you can differentiate by the spin groups. And the nice thing in this case that this is one third, one third, one third um, of all the systems. So it is abundant. It is not just unique. It's not just one example. Ooh, just, just an anomaly. It is one third of all the magnetic groups, or by the, of, of, the, of the spin uh, uh, point groups that you can actually identify. Uh, having that, you can actually now begin to actually say some important aspects of, of uh, characteristics that this has. Um, the outer magnets, these outer magnets that have these spin symmetries, um, can, will occur both in inversion symmetric uh, or asymmetric magnetic crystals. They can break parity. That's not a problem. Now, of course, because you don't have no spin orbit coupling, uh, the bands themselves, whether you are, whether you, your uh, system is broken or not, it will be inversion symmetric if you don't take into account spin orbit coupling. If you turn on spin orbit coupling, they could break that symmetry, but it would be very hard to even detect some of them because it's usually weak. Uh, the gamma points, they tend to be, they are degenerate, but other trims, which is called time reversal um, uh, uh, momentum, uh, momentum, invariant momenta, can be split, which is not the case in uh, due to spin orbit coupling. They are k-independent axis of the spin. So the spins in this case will not depend where they point on the momenta itself. You just have a spin up and spin down. It's just colors to you. And uh, in this case, the winding numbers that are associated with this mom spin momentum locking, uh, they are even in winding number. And you can now compare that to the spin orbit coupling. This is related to your question, Sasha, uh, where you have, in this case, you have inversion asymmetric non-magnetic crystals. Otherwise, they don't appear. Uh, you have the band inversion is asymmetric in the spin space, containing the spin. Uh, all trims are spin degenerate, okay? Not just the gamma point, but all of them. Uh, the, 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 the texture itself depends on the momentum. So now your spin does align with the momentum, okay? 
and uh, the winding number is added winding number. So even from the phenomenology point of view, it is unique. You know, that's the nice thing that you can differentiate once you have that tool that can separate them. If you have the magnetic group, you couldn't separate them. It would all be mixed in there. Now, uh, you actually, this, this, this locking, this spin uh, momentum locking, I remember the spin can be in any direction, but it's just the up and down of how you have. Uh, you can now identify and classify into uh, six different classes. Some of them are planar, uh, where essentially there's no dependence in the z direction, but it's on the plane, on the kx, ky plane direction. And these are, can remind you of the Rushball Dresselhau types that are planar in this case. But you also have this vial type of a spin momentum lock in that you have in the bulk that you can identify here by all the classes. And here you have only two, four, and six winding numbers that you could identify uh, in your spectrum. Now, um, so once you actually do that, you can actually see that once you classify the spin groups, so in this case, how you actually write them, you can actually put them all, the 32 in there, okay? Now, none of these the magnetic spin groups has a corresponding magnetic group. This is one thing that I want to emphasize because people, it is actually something that I understand that is, you know, you've seen these tables and you thought this every symmetry in the world has been done. Of course, the tables have been created. But in this case, uh, um, they're not one-to-one. -one, okay? Uh, because the magnetic groups do not have this spin group only part of the symmetries. That, so essentially, they cannot, they're not built to distinguish. They're very, very good for many physics. But if you want the non-relativistic physics, that's not the tool uh, to be used. Uh, we also were able to identify with that uh, many of the anomalies, because those, these things just didn't come out of, uh, out of vacuum. Uh, all of this identification of the spin splittings in antiferromagnets uh, were known, you know, from the, you know, in, this, in the work from the 2012. We were able to backwards find them, of course. Uh, some of them were independently found by, by many, by NODA uh, in 2016, by us in, in, in the 2020 and 2017, and Hyome. Uh, there's several works by many people. Uh, now, uh, with, uh, both experimentally and theoretically, identifying them. But now you can actually identify just knowing the, in the, in the, by the symmetry grounds which one they correspond and understanding why these anomalies were appearing from a symmetry point of view, which is very powerful, of course, because that without doing the full calculation of DFT calculations, which are very expensive, you can already tell which ones will be or will not. Even some crystal, uh, crystal, uh, crystal groups, just by looking at the crystal, not the spin, uh, can be discard, discarded by looking at the spin group analysis. Okay. Uh, another surprise is that this occurs in both metals, uh, insulators, semiconductors, but even some firing cuprate uh, compounds. Lanthanum copper oxide is ultramagnet. What is the repercussions? We don't know. Huh? Uh, chromium and timonite are also showing some two-dimensional versions of them, also showing some uh, interesting features, in this case, uh, with a very high uh, nail temperature. So many of these things that we were able to, all of these things, by the way, that we've identified, all of these, uh, all of these materials that we identified, we have done the DFT calculations for them and show the direction. So in the actual paper, you will have all these materials calculated. They were not just looked up in a table, yeah? Because there's no really a, a classification on the spin group theory yet uh, that you can actually look up from the magnetic groups uh, or the Bilbao uh, repository of materials, etc. cetera, okay? Uh, but this is very intriguing. Actually, uh, when I talked to, uh, to Misha Kastnelson, he was not expecting it that he did some calculations, but never with these actual features in it. Uh, so we're going to try to do some of these calculations as well. And just to wind up, this is the last slide. I think I timed it okay. One thing that I want to emphasize that is alter magnets, they occur in, in, in several dimensions, in three dimension and two dimension. It can, they cannot occur, they cannot occur in one dimension. This, this, uh, this analysis uh, forbids it. Uh, they occur in both insulating, semiconducting, uh, and, and metallic, and even superconductors. Uh, there's a large range of materials, rutas, ruthenites, perovskites, uh, cuprates, ferrites, silicites, knictites, I can never pronounce that, 
uh, and calcogonites, no? you like those, um, have uh, those alter magnets in the glass themselves. And they themselves are showing a plethora of a lot of physics that can have repercussions in other fields. Uh, you have these this, uh, winding numbers uh, without, without correlations, the Fermi liquid D wave instabilities that you will see uh, in the, uh, the physics, the spin polarized currents that now have been observed, valetronics, valetronics that are different from the other valetronics because they are even in momentum rather than out in momentum. Uh, of course, have I showed you that the, this is the, the idea that you have GMR effects that are large. Uh, this has some multiple toroidal magnetism with the spin waves that we haven't really begun to explore of how the magnetic anisotropies will be playing a role, uh, whether they have played a role in D-waves um, uh, magnetism with superconductivity, we don't know. Uh, and the fact that you have a lot of topological physics appearing from the topological fall effect, etc. Uh, I think this is the beginning of, of looking at these materials much more seriously and uh, in a useful way. Now I have to mention the, uh, the, 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 the materials that have been used for manipulation of antiferromagnets. These manganese to gold and then copper manganese arsenide, of course, are not in that category. They're essentially the other class, uh, magnetic class of antiferromagnets, PT, but it's still a, uh, very useful. This is the other class that now are showing also different behavior. Um, that I think is going to be very exciting over the next few years. So with that, I'll thank you and uh, take some questions. And again, if I have been misrepresenting or not very clear, don't listen to my talk because I tend to bubble and say talk too much. The best talk is by uh, Thomas Youngworth that he just gave it in the Spy Center uh, YouTube channel as well that you can find if you, if you so wish to see it as well. And, and I should give, of course, the credit. Uh, I'm here as a, as a spokesperson of this young man, uh, Lee Wersmakel, which is uh, Thomas, have been driving all this physics, and particularly intellectually, it is Libor that has been driving all this physics. All of you guys know me here, and the, you understand that I knew nothing about symmetry a couple of years ago, yeah? Uh, so, so the, you know, I want to make that very, very, very clear that all of this intellect and discoveries are his and his alone. And I just have the pleasure and the fortune to be part of his team. Okay. And together with Tom, it's also driving Tom. Thank you. No questions. It's fascinating. Um, and in fact, there is a parallel with nuclear physics. We can discuss this later. But um, so you alluded uh, to the fact that then after you made a prediction based on uh, point group theory, you alluded to the fact that then you did the, the DFT, density functional theory. Yeah, both time, at the same time. At the same time, right? Absolutely. And, and they agree, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, because the, the symmetry analysis is very clear. Uh, and of course, the DFT calculations, these materials had been done before. It, they will be there. It's just did nobody look for them. Many times when you actually show these data, for example, in, in, in lanthanum uh, copper manganese arsenide, uh, sorry, in the cuprate uh, compound that I mentioned, if you look at the presentation of the data, they usually show in ARPAs to the high symmetry lines or high symmetry planes, which are spin degenerate. <laughs> so they wouldn't, not because you don't look for this physics. And then it had been observed. But of course, all of the th things that we're connecting with our symmetry analysis, we always do the hard, uh, of initial calculation to show that it's real. Some of the predictions that we did, like the uh, anomalous Hall effect, the crystal anomalous Hall effect, was before we developed uh, the, the Libor, they should stop saying we, yeah? Libor and Thomas developed uh, uh, this uh, spin group analysis. Uh, but of course, we wanted to understand is this just an anomaly? To me, it's, it's very reminiscent of how Nail discovered antiferromagnets. He's the one that discovered them uh, by analyzing peculiarities on paramagnets. Those are funny paramagnets, yeah? And then really understanding them. We don't have a back track record on predicting things that even the Russians didn't predict. Yeah? Sorry. <laughs> I say it with a lot of love. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Care to see if uh, any of the other cuprate uh, materials would be. Not all of them are. It's just the, uh, uh, not all of them, but, but you know, remember, this is a team of, I mean, Libor, um, 
he works 24 seven and a little extra at night. So, and he's primarily doing it, you know, driving it in terms of the calculations and the analysis and all those things. So, but are the upright superconductors? Not there. all of them do, not all of them are. Yeah. Of the cuprates. Yeah. So we're not claiming that this is the origin of high DC superconductivity, but it, but it, but it may be. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> Doubts it. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> But I, the, what the consequences of that is, is, is it could be interesting. Yeah, it could be, but there is no doping in your system and in Cooper. It's, it's very important. Any more questions? Or from Zoom? John. I don't know if, uh, how do you take the question from Zoom, by the way? Okay. There's no question of Zoom yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Joe, they are, we are checking their email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is on Zoom? I would like to see. Hey, Hans, we get some idea. Let's get to the good. Oh, here, Hans is gone, I think. Yeah, I saw him at the beginning. Is him a good ambition? Deutsche so, yeah, go. No, it's not a local strain. It's just the it's just the the orthorhombic order in of the root piles. So there's no strain in there. There's a crystal field, but it's crystal field without strain. It says anisotropy. The, 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 bands, the bands are anisotropic. You will affect it, yeah. There's actually some consequences of a strain. That's another collaborative research center that we're leading. Um, and that will affect the crystal fields, and therefore it will affect the symmetries. But you also break the symmetries themselves of the system. You will go to a different symmetry class. But in this case, you need that rotation because without that fourfold rotation, uh, you wouldn't have this alter magnetism. You need that uh, fourfold. The, the, the key thing in this case is that you have the time inversion comes in connection to a rotation, not a translation on an inversion, but a rotation. Uh, and if you, with a strain, you can break that. It would be a fourfold. But if you just go to, to, to break it totally, then it doesn't happen. Or it would change the symmetry. Other questions? Well, I actually have yeah. one. Oh, okay, L let me let me show. <laughs> so you, now, imagine that I consider two layer two layer system, and I call like which layer I'm in, my pseudo spin. Right. So that that spin space will be completely decoupled from uh, from two dimensional space which I'm in. Right? Space will will anything like that appear there? Um. A two-layer system, and then you want to well, I, I call which layer I am in. I call my pseudo spin. Right, but uh, where is the magnetic order there? Whatever, whatever order is the spin is that that pseudo spin is in the layer one. Yes, yeah, the pseudo spin. Oh, uh, forget about real spin. Just just uh, work with pseudo spin. Oh, because you see, this is actually you do have to have time reversal broken. This is connected to time reversal being broken. This is P, this is essentially you have to have R times T as your symmetry element. And this one doesn't. Because T is there. And then T guarantees spin degeneracy. If you have a spin degeneracy, T as a, as a symmetry, forget it. You don't have any of these physics. You have to have time reversal symmetry broken. And only T comes as R times T. In the in the uh, in the uh, in the symmetry class, in the symmetry right. class. of course, yes, sir. Lovely, but it's not. There may be an analog, uh, you know, to the. Uh, of course, I didn't think about it in terms of the quantum Hall effect of this. Yeah, that, uh, that, 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 that there could be an analogy, about. but then quantum Hall effect does have time reversal broken. So there, you could have it possibly have it, but that's a different story, probably. I haven't thought about it, but for just layers without with time reversal gone. A uh, yeah, very nice talk. So I have two questions, like, and, and, and actually, which are the, uh, regarding the symmetry. So first is, I'm still kind of confused, like, what can be captured by spin group that cannot be captured by magnetic group? Again? What is the phenomenon that can be captured by spin group? And Thank cannot... you. Yeah, I, I'll give you the 20 bucks later. But just to, this is a fantastic, this is a, because it is very important to understand what it cannot happen. 
you know, what the magnetic groups cannot do. Um, so essentially, these magnetic groups here, magnetic groups, some of them are going to tell you that you have only uh, magnetic groups that are only antiferromagnetic, but uh, among them, most of them are this Kramer's degeneracy. So you will not identify uh, uh, this, this uh, you know, you would just say, okay, it's just degenerate because it has PT degeneracy that we knew since 1930. Beyond that, nothing else can be done because the magnetic groups cannot separate the spin orbit coupling splittings from non spin orbit coupling splittings. They're all together. There is not a set separation between them. Uh, you also have a magnetic group, for example, cannot distinguish between a planar and a non coplanar uh, uh, magnetic ordering. So the same magnetic group will have both uh, coplanar and non coplanar order. There's not going to be a distinction between the two. Many magnetic groups, oh, sorry, I went backwards. Okay. Uh, the remaining of, so there's some on the, uh, uh, Antiferromagnetic, only magnetic groups, but the remaining cannot distinguish between antiferromagnet or ferromagnet to begin with. So you don't even know until you do the calculation that whether it's ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. Uh, I can show you this example. I mean, this is actually an example uh, that is simple. If you actually see this here, you can actually illustrate it here. I think I have it in one of the illustrations from the old talks. I hope I have it. Okay, here you go. So if you look at this, you see, this is the magnetic group, yeah, C2X. And if you can see here, this cannot distinguish between this one and that one. If you actually do this operation, both of them are C2X magnetic group symmetric, but one of them is a ferromagnet, one is an antiferromagnet. Uh, if you do the spin group, you will distinguish them because you have the spin only group analysis because you can actually work only on the spin space. The magnetic group doesn't have that. Um, there's actually a recent work as well from Zuger that claims to have a, a symmetry um, uh, guidance, which is unfortunately false. Uh, the only thing that is in that paper is actually that you rediscover Kramer's, degeneracy, uh, Kramer's theorem, which is said, take all the magnetic groups that are, have PTs as a, as a symmetry element and then ignore them. Because the rest of the part is about these groups that have time in connection with the translation and ignore those. This is the magnetic group four. But there's a bit of a problem there because they are the magnetic groups don't distinguish between planar and non coplanar. And you have non coplanar, this rotation that they identify and add to it, the spin rotation, does not exist. So essentially, you cannot, by symmetry grounds, of ignore all the type four magnetic groups. Have you ever considered about a uh, spin space group in the sense that uh, you consider the combined with some translation uh, symmetry? They are all there. No, no, we did, did our analysis with that. That's, you know, I mean, here we actually only focus on the spin point groups because it's easier. It just simply identifies in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, as you know, point groups are the ones that define the transport properties, et cetera. But they are all analyzed within the spin space groups. They will not be. The, the, they, it is easier to identify the point group because that will define you, whether you are an ultramagnet or not. The space group, of course, it will have all the, all the symmetries of your system in terms of your transport, but it will not affect, of course, as you know, conductivities or transport or anything like that. But they are there. They are, this, is, this tool, we don't claim to have created the tool. Litvin and others created that tool of separating those, but you need to use that tool. You cannot do that tool um, by fixing magnetic groups. They're not fixable. They're not built for that. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, do you see like the spin group is, has more elements there? Which Not only elements, but it has no correspondence. I mean, it's, you don't have a direct correspondence of a spin group to a magnetic group. There's not a such a thing. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. And uh, thank you, guys.